All right, here we go. You're damn right, everybody. Welcome to the show. Dustin is not here. I am here. Let's talk about movies for roughly an hour. It is Hoopercast Movie Hour. I said I wasn't going to do it, but my schedule freed up, cleared the docket, cleared the schedule. Right for you, people. That's right. Um, phone number 251-333-8732. Again, 251-833-8732. Excuse me. Um, Twitter at Connor underscore Dempsey at Dustin Weldon. Facebook.com slash Hoopercast. YouTube, iTunes, all kinds of goodies. All up in there for you. Um, yeah. So, let's get started. Um, just going to... Yeah, we've got one film to review for you tonight, a couple of news items, and uh, I forgot to prep for one of them, so you're going to see the audio. <laughs> I forgot to prep one of them, so let me go back and do that real quick so I can uh, decide whether or not to include it in the show. <laughs> okay, I'm back. Sorry, I forgot to watch that before I got on the show tonight, so I just thought I'd watch it real quick. Um, so yeah, with fresh eyes, uh, I must say that um, if you wanted something cool to watch tonight go over to uh, movieweb.com. They have a... Uh, no, sorry, that was not MovieWeb. That was on Screen Junkies. Um, they have a cool supercut of the of the t- 2018 year in film. And uh, it's about seven minutes long. And um, as always, with a good recap um, done by with by a good editor, um, it is uh, a nice little um, emotional roller coaster. So, yeah, uh, great stuff. Check it out. Um, <clears throat> so, real quick, wanted to talk about the uh, weekend box office while we're at it. Over the Christmas weekend, well, really, the, the pre-Christmas weekend, the 21st through the 23rd, um, we had a whole new box office. Um, yeah, the box office radically changed. So, the former num- two, the former 1, 2, 3 over the previous weekend was Spider-Man Into the Spider-Verse. Number two, The Mule. Number three, Dr. Seuss is The Grinch. They are all out of the top three this week. We had some new releases, and here they are. Opening at number one, easily, Aquaman from Warner Brothers with a $67 million weekend gross. That's bringing the total gross um, up to $72 million. Don't know what the budget was, but uh, yeah, that is domestically, of course, in the foreign market. Oh, my God. (laughs) The foreign market. So domestically, it's actually made $105 million. Foreign, it has made $451 million. Worldwide, $556 million for Warner Brothers on the first, you know, let's say in the first week it's in theaters. Insane numbers. Very good for Warner Brothers. Very good for DC. Aquaman's getting mixed reviews. Um, <clears throat> Dustin liked it. Um, people like it. People, other people are criticizing it. It just depends on what kind of movie you like. So big, big, big stuff. Not, uh, sorry, a very distant second. Very distant second. Almost, yeah, by a long shot. Number two, Mary Poppins Returns from Buena Vista and Disney. Uh, $23 million. Uh, that's a, that's domestically, what's the total gross? Sorry, domestically, domestically that makes four, because Mary Poppins opened on Wednesday, so that's about $50 million domestically, foreign, it's made $22 million. Um, so uh, yeah, there is Mary Poppins Returns, so uh, I don't know too much about it, I haven't heard anything about it, so uh, I'll leave it at that. Number three is our very own Bumblebee, which we will re- be reviewing later on in the show. I might have a little bit of a special guest for that. Stick around and see what that's all about. Um, Close third uh, for Paramount, $21 million. Although this one has a $135 million budget. So um, <clears throat> it's got a lot of money to make up. Foreign market, $31 million. So it puts a worldwide gross at $65 million. Um, and uh, yeah, just got a lot of ground to make up. So I don't know if that's going to be a financial success. We'll have to see. Um, so we'll talk about that movie itself later on in the show. Um, you've got second act uh, opening at number seven. Second act was, uh, God, which one was that? Oh, that's that Jennifer Lopez movie. $16 million budget. Worldwide, it's made a little bit over 15, so maybe they'll make its money back. Uh, opening at number nine, Welcome to Marwin with a $39 million budget, opening for about $2 million. What's up with this? Who directed this? Robert Zemeckis. Yeah. See, this one looks incredibly imaginative to me, but these are, it's a horrible opening, but I don't know. I. <clears throat> 
I don't know. I, I want to see that one. I'm interested in seeing it, but it's starring Steve Carell, Leslie Mann, uh, Diane Kruger, and Janelle Monae. Uh, it's just, it looks real interesting, but I don't know that it has broad appeal. I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I don't really know what else to say about that one. Um, that's the weekend box office numbers. Uh, a whole new top three. So the Grinch, um, the Grinch still made $8 million over the weekend. Um, and it brought up its total gross to $253 million. So again, very good for Universal. I'm still impressed by that. Um, yeah. All right. Yeah. Spider-Man fell number four, the mule fell number five, the, the Grinch to number six. So it was a straight up replacement, no reshuffling on the lower three there. Um, this could all change this weekend at the box office. What's opening is um, five films, but two of, two of which I have heard of and think might make a difference. There's Holmes and Watson uh, with, uh, with Will Ferrell and John C. Riley. Um, as a... F- woo. This this says it has a 4% on Rotten Tomatoes. Wow. Maybe don't see that. Uh, and then there's of course vice, um, about Dick Cheney, uh, starring Christian Bale, Sam Rockwell, and also Steve Carell. So maybe go see vice instead. I don't know. I don't know what to tell you to see. Cause I, I mean that there's some good stuff in the theaters. There always is around the holidays. So, um, again, pick your poison. We have, uh, we have recommended that you see Aquaman, Spider-Man into the spider verse. Um, and Ralph breaks the internet. Um, yep. What about, what about Bumblebee? Stick around. Listen for that later. Um, Okay, and just this little last piece of film news I wanted to hit on since we're in a Transformers frame of mind. There's an article on MovieWeb uh, written by Ryan Scott today called Animated Transformers Cybertron Movie in the Works. So apparently they're exploring this idea uh, of this Cybertron movie, which would be fantastic because there's that's where the Autobots are from. That's where the war um, for their planet happened and why they fled. And uh, it's barely ever been explored pretty much anywhere um, in the Transformers canon. So we had the technology to make a full on Cybertron film. So we should do that. Um, let's see what the article says. Um, Paramount is likely to keep expanding the franchise, and that's going to include an all robot animated movie. Um, at one point, Paramount launched a writer's room for Transformers that produced more than a dozen potential projects, one of which took place entirely on Cybertron. Longtime franchise producer Lorenzo de Bonaventura has been making the rounds promoting Bumblebee, and during a recent interview, revealed that the movie is still happening and it's going to be animated. Um, he said the thinks the fans will really love it. Um, Let's see. Uh, uh, Travis Knight, the director of this, uh, recently talked about his desire to see a computer computer animated movie that takes place on Cybertron. He says, quote, well, actually, it would be a wholly animated movie because the beginning of the movie it's wholly animated because the beginning of the movie is completely animated. So, you know, it has live action lighting and textures and everything else. So it has that feeling, but I would love to see that movie. I got to tell you, that was one of the biggest thrills for me in this process was bringing Cybertron to life and seeing the fall of Cybertron, just a glimpse of it, because that's where the animated series began. And we wanted to begin this film in the same manner and to pay tribute to that. And it was so much fun. I've always wanted to see it and would love to see a movie like that. Um, I would love to see a movie like that. Uh, I hope they can do it. And, um, I think that um, I think that it could be good. The question is, could it be profitable? I don't know, but I'd watch that movie in a heartbeat. Um, you still need good script and good characters. Don't just have a bunch of pew pew shooting because um, that's where you'll lose people and waste a ton of money. You got to make sure that people care about these characters and are invested in the dynamics. Of what's going on? Um, yeah, so that's a little bit of film news there. I'm I'm I'm, I'm distracted because there's some auto and some ad auto playing. Um, apparently, Kevin Spacey is answering his uh, his sex assault charges with a video, but I don't think. Oh, that's something else. Um, I don't think I want to delve into that right now. Um, so we're just, we're just going to leave it at that. Um, yeah, this isn't really a full Hoopercast movie hour. This is more of like a half hour, maybe 45 minute type deal. I don't know how long this review of chance of Bumblebee is about to be. So, um, how about this? Let's take a break. 
When we get back, we will talk about Bumblebee and I will bring on my special guest. Um, Be right back. And we're back. I'm here with Amelia. Hi, Amelia. How are you? Good. You're doing good? Yep. All right. Did you now, will you tell everybody what we did uh, on Christmas Eve for your birth, for uh, some of your birthday celebrations? We saw Bumblebee at the at the at the surprise and and we really loved it more than we loved daddy what we loved it more than we loved daddy okay well i didn't didn't love it that much but of course i love myself a lot more than i love this film but uh yes i took my daughter to her first outing to the to a real movie theater um and and we go two days two days skip wednesday Amelia would like to go back every other day. Uh, I said that Daddy and skip Wednesday and skip Wednesday because no way goes to the theater on Wednesday. They listen to the Hoopercast, but um, I think that uh, we're going to run out of money pretty quick if we do that. Yeah, I just want to play a game. I know you do. I know you do. Yeah. It's just Daddy's going to ride. Going to run out of money. Um, Okay, so let's talk about the movie then. So yes, Amelia and I saw Bumblebee. This was the the film I chose to break her into the movie going experience, and I took Amelia to see Bumblebee because Amelia has is a really big fan of a show that we watch on Netflix. And what's the show that we watch on Netflix? Uh, Bumblebee and in, in, um um Bumblebee saw a little girl. And- wait a minute! Wait a minute! Wait a minute! Answer my question. What show do you like to watch on Netflix with the Autobots? Uh, Transformers Prime is Optimus Prime. Yes, Transformers Primes. And we've talked about that on the show before. We've we've reviewed that on the show. Uh, so maybe about Optimus Prime that that been reversed from, from a little little boy. Well, so do you remember at the beginning of the movie when they're on Cybertron? And they're they're fighting the Decepticons and Optimus is there and Wheeljack is there. Um, and, uh, and Bumblebee escapes. Do you remember, um, the Cybertron stuff? Mm-hmm. So I, I talked about this earlier in the show. They're actually going to make a, they're, they're trying to figure out how to make a whole movie that's on Cybertron. Do you, yeah. Would you watch that? Uh-huh. That'd be fun to see a whole thing on Cybertron. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, so Bumblebee was released over this past weekend. Uh, this is directed by Travis Knight, starring Haley Steinfeld, John Cena, and you know a few other people featured, but mainly Haley Steinfeld as the lead character. Uh, what's her name? Charlie. Um, and uh, this is technically this is within. <laughs> we'll get into this. This is sort of within the timeline of the existing Transformers films, but the film itself is a is a prequel. It's set in 1987, and. Um, uh, Basically, um, it sort of follows a pretty standard formula similar to the first Transformers where, um, uh, a, a, you know, a teenager, um, in this case, uh, Haley Steinfeld, uh, encounters Bumblebee um, and um, while he's also being pursued by the military and um, and also the Decepticons. So, um, Amelia, did you like Bumblebee? You did? What did you like most about Bumblebee? What was your favorite thing about the whole movie? Um, sleeping. Sleepy. Hmm? Sleepy. No, what was your favorite part? What what part of the movie did you did you like the most? What what was the best part of the movie to you? Uh Bumblebee was great and um getting the the um Cybertron. Yeah, so I think you're trying to say that you really liked did you like the character Bumblebee? Did you want him to win? You did? Did Could you, um, when Bumblebee did stuff, were you worried about him? You were? Can you speak? You were worried about him? Uh-huh. Yeah? Um, when Bumblebee was in danger, did you, were you scared for him? No? Okay, well, I know you weren't, like, frightened, but were you concerned about him? No? Okay. Was it because you didn't care or because you knew he would win? I knew he would win. You knew he would win? Uh-huh. Yeah, so um, I think what Amelia is getting at is the characterization of Bumblebee is once again pretty well executed in, in these movies. Um, mm-hmm. Through whatever it is, motion capture or animation or however they chose to get the performance. Um you at least I felt connected to Bumblebee in this, um, as he's probably one of the more vulnerable and emotionally accessible audio Autobots. 
Um, and that, of course, does uh, Bumblebee talk in this movie? No, but he d- some, but but he does. But when does he talk? Um, he talks when he doesn't get any killed. He talks, uh, yeah, so at the beginning of the film, Bumblebee is maimed, and uh, he that is when he loses his voice box, and uh, and eventually in the film learns how to talk through the radio. So I'm confused about where this, <clears throat> how this film is supposed to affect the Transformers timeline, because I've talked to friends uh, recently, and they've said that, um, oh, there's a young um, Simmons, who's John Turturro's character in the uh, Michael Bay Transformers films um in the sector seven part so it's like oh okay so they're keeping simmons as part of the canon and of course at the end of the film bumblebee transforms into the um the same camaro that he is um at the beginning of the first transformers film um the fact that he loses his voice learns how to talk to the radio um uh so all that stuff is sort of within canon what's not within canon is the fact that this is the autobots first time on earth um where apparently in the last night it was established that they fought uh they fought in world war ii uh so that's sort of wiped clean from the canon um and uh and there's a whole lot of other inconsistencies i won't get into right here on this show um The point is, in my mind, I treated this as a soft reboot. This is sort of like, this to me seems like they were wanting to see how this goes. If if this does well, and are critics going to say that it did well because it isn't the Michael Bay films, or because it supplements them as a, a nice addition to the collection? In my opinion, if people say that this movie is good, and that it is good precisely because it's not a Michael Bay directed Transformers film, then Universal might decide that, oh, yeah, we're gonna we're going to um <clears throat> sorry, not Universal, Paramount. Um Paramount might decide we're going to make the new franchises based off of this and we're ignoring Michael Bay's movies. If people decide, oh, this is great because it ties in so well to the movies, then they might just keep this as part of the canon. I don't think they should do that. To me, this is a completely new franchise because the Michael Bay, because everything's different. The character designs are different. This main character is different and they mess with the canon. Yes. There's, 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 um, there's stuff in the timeline that makes sense in the other films, but you could also chalk those up to just references to people who have been fans of the films with Simmons in there in sector seven. But just because Bumblebee is also Camaro and the same kind he is when Shia LaBeouf buys him, that doesn't mean that this has to necessarily connect to the, to the films. And honestly, I'd rather not because those are already muddled as it is. And I'll go ahead and get into what I thought of this movie. Cause I'm just talking about it from a logistical standpoint. I liked this movie. Um, I didn't love it. Um, but I thought there there was a few interesting things at play and I think that this is overall, you liked it it all the time. I know. Yeah. Amelia liked it. Um, I liked it because it's a step in the right direction for how these films should have been executed from the beginning. Um, uh, this is what people wanted when they announced the first Transformers film with Shia LaBeouf and they sort of got through it and you know, mixed reaction to their way through the Michael Bay Transformers films, those five movies, because in one, on the one hand, people were getting what they wanted, which was big CG robots that sounded like they were heavy, that, that, that sounded like the characters, um, and that fought in big action, live action, um, large scale set pieces that you just didn't see, um, with the cartoon, but they sort of, it was a deal with the devil because one, they got that stuff they wanted, but what they did not get was character work with the Autobots very well. Um, they got way too much focus on the human characters because I guess the studio felt like studio screenwriters on a five films made the same mistake where they didn't connect people to the human characters. Um, or they, and they didn't do enough work with the, with the robot characters, which is what people came to see. Um, so they sort of played that, they sort of rode that line that Dustin and I talked about with the Grinch, um, the animated, the new Grinch movie, which was, this is just good enough to make money, but it's not good enough to actually be a good or challenging film. Did you go, do you want to say something? Uh-huh. What? Go ahead. You, you can talk. Is- no, we're not talking about that. We're not going to talk about that. That has nothing to do with what we're talking about. Bumblebee, um, 
what he does is he doesn't talk more at the end. Right. No, he's still not talking at the end of the film. Um, he doesn't talk anymore. Right. But what he does is it does do is talk with his actions. Um they do a good job of the nonverbal communication in here. And they do a lot of the talking through through the Charlie character, through Haley Steinfeld. Uh, Haley Steinfeld, I've been following her as much as, you know, has, has you know, interested me um, with her career. I tend to be more likely to watch something if I know that she's in it. Um, she was obviously great in True Grit. Uh, she may, she's... Um, uh, what else have I seen her in? A couple other things, but most, but main the more the most recently I've seen her in that I thought she was great in was The Edge of Seventeen. I thought she was tremendous in that film. Um, if you haven't seen it, go check it out. But um, she's great in this one because um, her performance. She does a really good job, I think. Of, of of I'm just with her. I'm with her character. I'm with her and her struggle against her mom and her mom's you know new husband, I guess, and um, dealing with the dealing with having lost her father. Um, just who died prematurely just from health health reasons um i you know i, I like and i like and, and empathize with this character and um i just it's it's nothing like super deep um one of the things that this movie doesn't do very it, it writes her pretty well and it writes her experiences really well but it doesn't it doesn't write the other characters that well. Like her parents are underwritten. Her friend, her, her, you know, the, the, the boy in this movie is underwritten. Her brother's underwritten. John Cena is way underwritten. He's just a stock military, um, dude. Uh, and everyone's underwritten, but Haley Steinfeld and she's, what's up? Um, about Bumblebee in the movie is, is he, um, is he took a friend? It, um, Every police is just get um, Bumblebee out of here that that wants him. Right. So, like I said, the military is 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 once again an active part of this of this story where um, they encounter Bumblebee shortly after he comes after he um, arrives on Earth, and so of course they want to hunt him down. Um, but it's mostly that they get to him because these two Decepticons follow him down to earth what are their names let me see the decepticons a uh, shatter and dropkick <laughs> i think that's their names um i can't even find the well all right i think it's uh, yeah, anyway angela bassett and justin thoreau um yeah triple changers um and uh so you've got those two threats against Bumblebee, um, sort of keeping the plot moving, um, and they're, you know, who's going to find him first and then, um, what's going to happen when they do. Um, what's up, Humbun? I'm just eating those feelings. Okay. Do you want me to play you out? Are you, are you all done with your review? No, I'm just... Do you think, hey, do you think other kids would like this movie? Can you speak? Yeah. You would? Do you think they do it? They would? All right, we're gonna say goodbye to Amelia tonight, okay? No, kiddo, you're not you're not talking. It's okay. I'm doing. No, it's okay. We're done. Mm. You gotta tell everyone bye. Bye bye. Bye bye. Okay, sorry, I was just getting hard to do. Um, hard to keep focused. Um, so that's the plot. Military's after Bumblebee. The step guns after Bumblebee. And meanwhile, Bumblebee is sort of serving in this, I wouldn't say surrogate father role. That's clearly what she's missing in her life. Um, but, uh, he's sort of, she's coming of age in a way, and she's working through her grief, um, through Bumblebee. Um, yeah, like I said, the film delivers on some action on some pretty good action, but it's not like, it's not, is overdone as the Michael Bay films. It's not extremely and unnecessarily violent or destructive. Um, and, uh, and you can tell what's going on because the character designs are better and a little bit more distinct and colorful. Um, they're not just like, these big silver sprawling, like impossible and indistinct character designs from Michael Bay's movies. They, they're, they're a lot closer to what people are calling the G1 designs of the Autobots. So they're just easier to recognize. They look a little bit closer to what they looked like in the, in the animated series. Um, 
Bumblebee has always been pretty easy to spot, so it's it's tough to compare that. But um, the action is still, I, I was still a little underwhelmed. People were saying the action was incredibly easy to follow because it was well shot. There's still a whole lot of like quick cutting and relatively close or shaky things that are going on. But yes, overall, the action is better and better shot than it was in the Michael Bay films. Um, it's just that, um, I, yeah, I just, I, I guess I, there's still room for improvement. There's, there's ways to do that just with the longer, I mean, it's animation. I don't know why we can't have a longer take. Like I get it if the, if the, if the actors are bad or, you know, we're trying to cover some poor stunt work, but the entire sequence is done in post. Like you can't do any better than that. So I, I think maybe it had to do with money. I think what was the budget of this movie? 135. That seems plenty high. Anyways. Um, but I like the film overall. And um, I would like to see more Transformers films done by done uh, um, approached this way. Um, this film was written by a female. Her name is Christina Hodson. She wrote a movie called Shut In, a couple other things. Um, this is definitely her biggest title to date. Um, and as I said, a lot of the side characters are underwritten. Um, I don't know if it was time or if it was just lack of interest or whatever, or, you know, you, Paramount playing the odds with who people are going to be interested in in the film. But I will have to dock the film points for the screenplay just being relatively basic. But like I said, through the, through the scripting and through the performance, the Haley Steinfeld character is is really um, engaging. And um, and I, you know, I, I liked her and I was rooting for her um, and I wanted her and Bumblebee to succeed. Um so yeah, this is this. There's not look. Uh, this film, uh, as I said earlier in the show, made uh, uh, twenty one million dollars over the weekend. So um, you know, probably not as strong of an opening as as maybe they were hoping. Um, of course, that's just domestically. But um, I think that people will enjoy the movie. Um, it it does get a little slow in some places, although the, uh, it's one of those double-edged swords. Like, yeah, it's not crammed full of action, but it also does a lot better with the character beats. So, you know, pick your poison. If you want wall-to-wall action, it's not going to be Bumblebee. Um, Bumblebee is more restrained than the other Transformers films, um, <clears throat> as it should be. It's it's an origin, or it's an, it's an intro story, basically. It's a dip your toe in, here's the Transformers universe on the big screen. And I think people might have come out to see this more or if they had seen it might have enjoyed it more at least i might have enjoyed it a little more if it had been the first transformers film and i think part of the not the fatigue but the lack of like you know impression it makes has everything to do with the john carter symptom which is we've seen five films done like this basically before so here comes a sixth one and it's probably better than all those movies, but there's a lot of elements about it that aren't novel anymore. Um, and that's not the film's fault. It's just a timing thing. But if you judge it purely on its own merits, this is well done. Um, and I would see more films like this if they were made. And I would love to see, I don't know why she'd come back, but if the Haley Steinfeld character was back, I'd be interested. I just really hope they don't do that because there's no reason for her character to come back. Um, in subsequent films. And I hope that, you know, Paramount's smarter than that. Um, so yeah, I would give this film probably three, three and a half stars. I mean, there's nothing like super special about it. It's just good. This is the way this should have been done. Um, and next time let's take a few more risks and, uh, and really show the audience something. And, uh, I'd say take a few more character risks, have the Autobots more involved. I want the group dynamic to be a bit more interesting. I want them to make interesting choices as characters. And I want them to make questionable choices as characters. And I want I want people's loyalties or, or level of like for these characters to fluctuate. Um, I still prefer Transformers Prime in terms of the story of the Autobots told on screen. I still prefer Transformers Prime. That That's still my gold standard. Some of the Michael Bay films do a good job with the action, but that's purely a budget thing. But Prime, in terms of character, it's plot and story, not just, oh, good emotional beats, like, no, good stories, good ideas for, for a science fiction television show, um, good ideas for this group of characters and these enemies, great, incredible writing on Prime, I must say, um, 
So this doesn't reach those heights, but it can because there's people out there who know how to do it. So go talk to those people, learn how to do it, and then just do it on the big screen and you'll have a hit. Um, and a hit that people don't make fun of. The previous five Transformers films made money, but people made fun of them because they were bro and shallow and pretty much all spectacle. And I think we're finally getting to this point in movies, partly because of Me Too, partly because of the Marvel films, partly just because of the movie going on experience in general and audiences are getting smarter and they're deciding, Hey, I don't need all this flashy shit to, to entertain me. I'd love so, a little bit, something a little bit deeper because all of a sudden I think people are going, wow, I'm seeing some mind. They're seeing enough criticisms of mindless action that they're going, Oh, I feel kind of self-conscious that I'm into that. Maybe I should read more books. And the theater's like, no, no, for God's sake, no, don't read books. Please don't read books. <laughs> oh, we'll do anything. You want better films? Here, here, here's better films. Please, God, hold on. No, it'll take about five to seven years to make better films. Please wait on us. And I think really that's what's happening. I think that we're going to get better films, better written films and films that show a little bit more restraint. And I think studio studios will be okay with that because they'll go, oh, once they realize that better films are not a financial risk, they actually are about a zero sum game because, yeah, you might take in less of an opening box office or a second week box office when people hear that the film's not mindlessly action packed. But guess what, douche? You spend less money on it, too. You can lower that budget when they show you a script and they've only highlighted a few pages for action and you go, oh my God, I'm used to uh, one half of the script being an action sequence with dollar signs attached to it. It's like, nope, nope, we don't need big stars. We don't need a ton of action sequences. And here's a creative director who knows how to shoot, um, who knows how to shoot an effects film um, and sort of you know, cut costs and we don't have to abuse the visual effects company to do it. Here's how we do it. Boop, boop, pretty simple. Um, keep the overhead low. That's how you make successful films. You want to keep the overhead low. Why do you think a lot of films were written so much better, um, in, 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 in previous decades or on the independent circuit? Cause they don't have any money and they know that, wow, we don't have any money. Our only chance to make an interesting film is to have an interesting story. I wonder where you get those. Oh, <gasps> maybe it's our imagination. Oh my God, guys, is it our imagination? I think that's where we're supposed to get this is the imagination. (gasps) My God. Imagine that if you can. So go see Bumblebee. It's worth the theater experience and um, it's refreshing. And um, I imagine, you know, especially, I mean, I took my daughter to see this and one of the main reasons was because I had read and assumed correctly that this would not be a bro exploitation of women or a bunch of dumb jokes or a bunch of sex jokes or a bunch of drug parents jokes. It was just giving me a nice story with a, with a young female lead, um, and her relationship, friendship, kinship with this alien robot who is trying to basically signal to his comrades that they have a safe haven and to hurry because their enemies have found them. I did that's forget that part. But, um, I took her to that because I thought it'd be a safe place to, to, to show her a film. And I still think it, it is, um, just overall objectively the, the, the franchise, I'm going to go ahead and say, this is probably, I'm going to guess it's a franchise. Um, has a little bit of growing to do, but it's a great first step and they just need to make sure the next one that they don't learn the wrong lessons from this movie. Like I hope they're in a boardroom right now, breaking this down going, okay, why did this work? Or why didn't this work? Like what, what did we learn and how do we take the right steps to make it successful without overcorrecting one way or the other? A lot of sequels do that. They overcorrect, they go bigger and louder or they go way too crazy and they lose everyone. It's inaccessible. Small adjustments. Small adjustments. All right? And that's what Bumblebee is. It's a small adjustment, in my opinion. So, let's keep going. That's it. That's the Hoopercast Movie Hour this week. Um, yep. It's Again, this is a surprise episode. So, uh, you know, next, uh, next week we will not be here uh, there will not be a Hoopercast movie hour next week this is a little bonus holiday episode because it's the season of giving and i figured i should give to you and had an idea and some time and it was convenient for me and my schedule that's the only reason i did it <laughs> all right 
Have a good night. Get out there, see some good movies. There's some good stuff in theaters. See you next time. Cheers. Cheers.